I love the ASB version of the text. You guys have figured that out already. So I'm going to begin reading at verse 1. And when the day of Pentecost was now come, they were all together in one place. And suddenly there came from heaven a sound as of a rushing of mighty wind. And it filled all the house where they were sitting. And there appeared unto them tongues parted asunder like as of fire and sat upon each one of them and they were all filled with the Holy Spirit and began to speak with other tongues as the Spirit gave them utterance now there dwelling in Jerusalem were Jews devout men from every nation under heaven and when this sound was heard the multitude came together and were confounded because they heard every man speak in his own language. And they were all amazed and marveled, saying, Behold, are not all of these Galileans? And now we hear every man speak in our own language where we are were born. Uh, for a moment, the word Galileans, what was astounding about what God was doing is the fact that the Galileans were the low class. They were the unlearned folk. They were the ignorant folk. And all of a sudden, the Spirit of God had them speaking other folks' language. People were astounded, saying, how can Galileans speak languages when they've not been in school? But the anointing of God had fallen on them. Listen, because it said, and we heard every man speak in our own language wherein we were born. Parthians and Medes, Edomites and dwellers in Mesopotamia, in Judea, Cappadocia, in Pontus, in Asia, in Pagria, and Pamphylia, in Egypt, and in parts of Libya, about Cyrene, and sojourners from Rome, both Jews and proselytes, Cretans and Arabians. We heard them speaking in our own tongue the mighty works of God. Again, remember, this was the initial filling of the Holy Spirit. This was the speaking of tongues. Glossia is the word. This is not that aesthetic tongues, but the tongues that need interpretation. This was them hearing people speak in language. One biblical theologian said that this is God reversing the Tower of Babel. Yeah. In the Tower of that Babel, he dispersed men yeah. by their tongues. Yeah. Yeah. But here in this portion, when the Holy Spirit comes, he put us back together with our language. Yeah. That's the power of the God that we serve. Yeah. And they were all amazed and perplexed, saying one to another, what meaneth this? But others were mocking, saying that they are filled with new wine. But Peter, standing up with the eleven, lifted up his voice and spake forth unto them, saying, You men of Judea, and all ye that dwell in Jerusalem, be it known unto you, and give ears unto my words. For these men are not drunken, as you suppose, seeing it is but the third hour of the day. But this is that which had been spoken through the prophet Joel. Somebody say, this is that. This is but that. this is that which had been spoken through the prophet Joel. Let's pray. Father God, I thank you for your anointing that's already here. I ask you to anoint and fresh my mind. The words, Lord, take me out of the way. Lord, you know exactly what needs to be said and what needs to be done. Help me as I attempt to teach and preach your passage the way you want it to be met by your people. You've already prepared the ground. Now touch lives, touch hearts, and have your way today. And let someone know that they've already, the prayer they've already prayed is being answered because they're standing again 
for sitting in, him, in your presence. In Jesus' name, amen. You may be seated this morning. For as long as the Spirit of the Lord will allow, I'm going to teach and preach from this thought. Unfinished business. Unfinished business. The job is not done. Unfinished business. The late great Kobe Bryant had a very well-defined way that he lived his life. He had defined his life in a way that it was called Mamba mentality. To explain this mama mentality, he once said, if you see me fighting with a bear, you better pray for the bear. Mm. He went all out. He was fearless. He left nothing to chance. He was a person who said, I'm going to be prepared better than anyone else I have to compete yeah. against. He gave a definition to this mama mentality. He said, it is the constant quest to make every day better than the day before. Yeah. And along with that, if you keep doing this every day, sooner or later, you will be better overall or forever. There's one clear place that this, you can see an example of this mom, mama mentality, and that is in the 2009 NBA championships, the finals, where the Lakers were hosting the Orlando Magic. In that 2009 matchup, the Lakers had gone ahead two games to none in this best of seven series. So Kobe, who had scored 40 points in that game, was sat down afterward to, give an, uh, to actually give an interview. And as he was sitting out there, as he does, very um, staunch and thinking and looked like he was being reserved, the reporter came out and said, hey, I'm waiting on this smile to come from you. Said, I mean, you're up to, oh, what's the story? Are you not happy? Are you not halfway happy? And Kobe responded, what is there to be happy about? Said, you're up to to nothing. He said, yeah, but the job's not finished. Amen. He said, is the job finished? Well, if the job's not finished, what am I happy about? As I was reading and preparing for this message, the Spirit of God laid on my heart. That's the response, or should be the response of every believer in God, that with the God that we serve, there's no way we should be sitting here not having the things we want. There's too many saints sitting around in God's house with unfinished business. You let your dreams go. You let some plans that you had. Life knocked you down and you never got back up. There's some situations that have happened to you, and in your mind, you just said, I'm going to no. But Kobe's response was, I'm never going to settle for just halfway. I'm never going to settle for just this is good enough. I'm never going to settle for it is over or too much time has passed by. I can't get that. How many know as long as there's a God on our side who has all power in his hand, there's no dream that I can't pick back up again. There's no way that I can't make my way back again. There's nothing that I lost that God can't win back. Y'all like, y'all don't hear me this morning, but there's Are you 
of this very thing. He who has begun a good work in you will continue to work it to the day of Christ. Did you hear what God said? I started working in your life, and I'm going to keep working your life. Even when you take time off, I'm not going to take any time off. I'm going to bring your life where it needs to be. How many know there's times we back up, but God did not back up? Because he said, I'm going to work it until the day of Christ. But I love this verse. Hebrews 12, verse 2 says, looking unto Jesus. What do I do when things get tough? What do I do when it looks like I can't make it? I start looking for my Savior if I have any sense. I start looking for a God who I know was able to grab my hand last time and pull me out of what I was in and get me back to a place now. Because what he said is looking unto Jesus. Watch this. The author and finisher of my faith. Okay, you don't have it. The author means what you desire is really not your desire. It's the desire God placed in your heart to desire. So if God placed something in your heart to desire, don't lose me. That means God's got enough anointing to bring your desires to pass. I wish there were about three people that would let somebody know. I know God knows how to bring your desires to pass. I know God can fulfill dreams. I know God can work situations out. Is there anybody who God brought back from a place they did not think they were coming back from? But the Lord said, here you sit this morning because of the good Okay, now you were children. Uh, I got you out of Egypt. 
Uh, but you know what I'm going to do? Because y'all like to complain. You ever seen complainers? Yes. Hey, you ever seen nothing right? They hold down and don't you get stuck. Come to your church and run into a complainer. Y'all ain't going to be yet. Complainers be ready to get mad at me. And they will steal your joy for you to get inside the building talking about complaining about everything. But here's what you need to understand. He said, because y'all
best in my life. And right. you know what the reason I hang in there is because that 42nd chapter and the 10th verse, he said in that verse that Job, God turned the captivity of Job after he prayed for his friends. And Job received twice as much as he had when he was done. Here's the key. When you trust God's way and he makes you a warrior, you trust God's timing and he makes you understand he's doing his best, and then you trust his plan, now he can use you in a big way because God is a finisher and that's what he's doing in this text. This text is about God having some unfinished business and God will never run around with unfinished business. You look at this text, we're in the second chapter of the book of Acts and what we're going to find out from this is it is 10 days after Easter. Jesus has been resurrected, went to the grave, settled the debt, death, hell, and the grave, settled our sin, debt, and all of a sudden he went up to heaven, sat on the right side of God. But the redemption plan was not just to save us, but not give us any power. Y'all don't hear me. He said, it's only halfway done. God said, I saved you, I sent my son, but y'all still don't know how to have me in life because I see too many of my servants walking around without power. So what I need to do now is make my promise good by giving you the same power I use to resurrect Jesus. I'm going to place it in your life so you can get your unfinished business taken care of. Somebody say unfinished business. What God does is, he said, I don't like my servants walking around with unfinished business. Living the life they're supposed to live. When God said there's more, if you trust the resurrection power that I gave in Jesus Christ. So let me get my points here so we get out of this text. So if you go, go with me. Go Bible days. Children of Israel. The children of Israel had found themselves so messed up because they had no faith. And now God's apostles found themselves in one of those same kind of conniptions. Followed them. The Jewish authorities after them. The Roman authorities after them. And there was also uh, this savior they were following had allowed himself to be crucified like a crook. A modern day crook. And yet they were still holding because the first verse of this text says, and when the day of Pentecost had fully come, they were all in one accord. Did you see that? The day of Pentecost, the promise of the power was there. And even though their lives had been broken, they were also still right there. Here's the question. If God shows up, will you even be there to receive the supernatural power? Has your trials, has the things you've gone through you know, darkens your life so much that you won't even keep reaching out to God. You will continue to walk around in your life with a job not done. God said, no, no, no. I'm sending the power. These disciples were still waiting on God no matter how bad the situation got. It says they were all on one accord sitting inside because the first thing they knew is God is going to fulfill his promise. Write this down. Your first point. The season of fulfillment has come. Amen. Your season. Somebody say my season. my season. God works in seasons. But you got to claim your season. And sometimes the worst time in your life is the best time to get blessed. He says your season of fulfillment is coming. You can't see it if you lost your faith. You can't see it if you're not still waiting on one accord. You can't see it if you're not looking for it. But your season has come. Oh, But you never worshipped me. You never waited on me. You never believed I was coming through. So here you are now, still walking around with that piece of unfinished business that I finished. Had you been waiting, it takes faith to stand strong when God says, I need you to stand through your unfinished business. And the great thing about it is in verse 3 of chapter 1 of Acts, he said God showed himself 40 days to a whole lot of folk. And he showed himself so that we, the word actually says infallible proof. 
in Acts chapter 1 verse 3. In Acts chapter 1 verse 8, God said, no, I also told you to wait until you receive the promise of power. Here is God saying, I'm finishing my unfinished business. It was good to have Easter, but there's also a resurrection. And now it's time for you to be empowered to handle your life. So God said, I'm going to finish what I started if you wait for the promise. But you've got to have enough faith to wait. You say you love me, but you're sleeping with two other people. Uh -oh. Where that come from? You tell me you love your job, but you miss three days every, three days every week. God said, you tell me you love me, but there's no action. You, you say you believe me, but you don't really believe me, especially when things get tight. Oh, man, when things are loosey-goosey, you can praise me and worship me with a big smile. But when things start falling apart, like a man who was out running and slipped off a cliff, mm -hmm. on his way down of this cliff, he was able to grab a branch. And he was hanging on. And as he was hanging on, he was a believer. So he reached up and he said, God, that's what you call when you get in trouble. Oh, God, come help me. And he's holding on to the branch and he's hollering, God, nothing happened. He said, is there anybody out there? Please, God. All of a sudden, a voice came from heaven. I hear you. It is me, God. I understand your predicament. Do you believe in me? And they said, yes, I believe. He said, well, good. He said, because you don't have to worry about anything. Any situation, if you trust in me. The man said, I believe. He said, well, let go of the branch. Some time went by. <laughs> then the man did what we all do. Hey, he looked up and said, Is there anybody else up there? And so we go, and we don't like what God said. We turn to the world and say, Is there anything else I can do? I don't like that, God. I'm going to do my thing. Because we say we have faith, but we don't really have faith. We don't believe God. Not when things get tough. But God said, you got to understand something. It's a season of your fulfillment. And I like the way God fulfills. Look at this. Because this, this is so, so awesome. God said, it's time now for me to bring my Holy Ghost to the church. Now I'm talking about tongues. I'm all over the world. So I'm talking about so you can understand a theological position that the Bible talks about in tongues. Tongues, in this instance, is not talking about aesthetic tongues. Aesthetic tongues are the tongues that God or the Holy Spirit speaks inside the saint for the edification of the saint, read your Bible, and then sometimes in a group for the edification of that saint to edify the rest of the group. But you're not supposed to be walking around all the time speaking in tongues. This is glossia, which means language. God is saying that I gave them the language on the initial filling to learn something of the Holy Ghost. This is the initial filling of the Holy Ghost. This is not the baptism of the Holy Ghost. And all the baptism of the Holy Ghost is, is that you are supposed to continually be filled. But this is when God said, I'm going to first initiate the Holy Spirit. So if people tell you, you don't have the Holy Spirit because you don't speak in tongues, they're lying. You can speak in tongues and not speak in tongues, but the reality is, the Holy Spirit came on this day. This is an initiation. This is God finishing business. This is when God said, I'm going to give the power to my church they need so they can finish their business. So this was an initial Feeling. That's why they saw so many people. So the day of Pentecost just means 50. It is the 50th day after the harvest, the wheat harvest specifically, after the wave offering. They would take two loaves of bread, and they would give a wave offering of God, which was 10% of their harvest, where we came back from the first fruits office. This is called the first fruits offering after 50 days. Now, Pentecost was when the law was given to the Old Testament saints, but Pentecost was when the anointing was given to the church. Learn something. And so what happens is, we understand now, when somebody says about the Holy Ghost, we know I'm part of God's family because I had that initial feeling, and he gave me that feeling. So when I get into trouble, I got power to get out of it. Yeah. Somebody understood me. The reason you get out of your situation is because God knows how to give power for you now. The word person that, I'm talking, listen, y'all, I'm talking about a midnight hour. When your back's against the wall. And your bills aren't paid. And something going funny in your relationship. And your mind ain't acting 
acting right and your body is sick and you feel like giving up because I know anybody ever been there with me and you feel like I don't know how to go on but then in the middle of the night right when you thought you were done here comes the anointing of God to tell you you can make it to the have I got a saint that heard a voice that said every midnight hour has a sunny morning if you hang on many of us have been there you gotta praise him. Because every promise God makes, he brings to pass. Right. And so Adam and Eve, way back in the garden, at the end of time, a deliverer was coming. Jesus came. Told Abraham to stay way past childbirth. Mm. You have a child. Yeah. The child came. He told Rahab the harlot, even though you're a prostitute, when I destroy Jericho, your family yeah. is going to be saved. And it came. Yeah. He told us ah. that the blood of Jesus Christ was able to deliver the biggest sinner. And here we sit. All the big sinners. Because we know God can deliver. I know some of y'all don't think y'all are the biggest sinners, but what God has said is my problem. Amen. 
In fact, I'm going to this text. I got to get there. You see what it says? And suddenly, there were a sound of mushroom mighty wind came in, and God, the Holy Ghost came in, and they were speaking with clothing tongues of fire. I told you what those tongues were, as the Spirit gave them utterance. But another thing is you got to remember, you got to go God's method. Quit trying to believe God the way other people believe God. Don't listen to other folks' stuff. I just told you about one accord, but don't you get in alignment with somebody who don't believe in God's deliverance. Don't you be afraid with somebody who keeps telling you what God cannot do. Don't sit around when you start telling people your dreams in your heart. They want to cut them down. I ain't never seen it be like that. Well, you ain't never seen it, but God can do it with me. First point of this gave you was that you understand season. Of fulfillment is coming. Second point I need you to understand is that the showers of his faithfulness will comfort you. The showers of his faithfulness. I'm alliterating again. Seasons, fulfillment, come. I'm going S F C. Doing it again. The showers of his faithfulness will comfort you. Look at the text. Each one of them were filled. All the different languages. But the only reason they were filled is because of God's blessing. And so it says that, they said, these men are drunk. So we're not drunk. we just been filled with the Spirit and suffered so much, we can't help but give God praise. So God has showered down, and he's so faithful as to what he said, that we knew God was going to finish what he started. You have to know that God can finish and fulfill what you need him to fulfill. Because here's where Peter said, we're not drunk, but this is that. I already explained to you something. Last time I'll teach this deep in this message. This is that does not mean there's going to be a whole bunch of prophets and people prophesying in the end days now. Look at the text. He's talking about Joel, which is an eschatological book, end time book. Because people like to grab and say, well, God poured out his spirit on men and women. But listen, when you take the whole prophecy, the rest of that is that the moon's going to sprout blood and the sky's going to be dark. How come you want half of it, but you don't want the other half? Because this is not the fulfillment. Peter never said this is the fulfillment. He said this is like that. Are we mean? He said this is the same anointing that I have now. is going to be the same anointing that's going to help us survive the tribulation period. Yeah. He said the same Holy Ghost that is coming because the first time we came. He said it's the same Holy Ghost that's going to be there. Can you see what God is doing? He's giving us the analogy that once my anointing comes and I finish it, it's going to work all the way out to the death of tribulation time. Amen. So what God is saying is this is that. What do you mean this is that, Reverend? It means every time I survive, I need to let somebody know this is that. When you see me shouting after you know what I've been through, you need to realize it ain't nothing but the Holy Spirit living trust God. They're talking about a recession getting ready to come and trouble getting ready to come. But the thing I know about God, that don't bother the real saints. Because no matter what kind of trouble comes in this world, I don't care how much virus they have, I don't care how many wars they have, how many know God made a promise and he fulfills his promise that he will supply our needs according to his riches in glory. How many know you ain't worried about what's happening because you got you a big dose of business that Prophesied, that's true, that come. But this text is not that. And I do believe in the power of the baptism of the Holy Spirit and the speaking of the Holy Spirit, but I do know this passage does not talk that. This passage is about God saying, I'm coming now to make people who can handle their business. The only reason he said this anointing was so you and I would know it's on. Let me just share this with you, and I'm gonna close. Watch this. When me and Marshall was younger. We were poor. Her fault. I'm just kidding. My fault. We were poor. And everybody, I know nobody's ever done this, but have you ever now? I remember we used to do this a lot when we were younger. I would 
write checks, and then try to get the money in the bank for the check back to the bank. I don't know if anybody ever did that. <laughs> but you had to go ahead and pay stuff. You weren't really paying stuff. <laughs> you had to try to pay stuff. So I remember flying to the bank, trying to get to the bank for the check hit. Sometimes I didn't make it. So there was something called insufficient funds. Remember that? So after all that time, I would get, we go to the bank. I was scared to even send marks to the bank. Insufficient funds. <laughs> so I remember, as we got doing a little better, got our bills paid, got some money in the bank. Do you know what happened to me? I was still scared of going to the bank. Even though I had my check stuff, I knew the money was in there. Sometimes I knew I just put the money in. I knew I paid the bills. There was money in there. But I'd go in there and check the map before I walked in and take some money out because I, I was still scared. I mean, I knew my needs were met. I knew I got my check. I knew the money was there. Oh, I know y'all know what I'm talking about, but it was like I was scared to go to the bank. I walked in the bank and shake instead of being confident. God said that's some of y'all. The day of Pentecost came. I gave you a blank check. Yeah. I said whatever you desire, whatever needs you have, they're already met. All you got to do is walk around in confidence, knowing that I've already met your need. There's somebody I'm speaking to right now, you may not be jumping around, you may not be hollering, but God told me to tell you this, that the reason you have not cashed in on your dream is because you're scared. Here it is. You know how he said, he said, not only 
Well, I make sure that the season of harvest is over. I'm going to make sure that my faithfulness is there. You can start over today. Somebody say today. You're watching me. Today is your day. So I'm going to finish my business. Every dream, everything I have, God's going to bring to pass. Everybody stay tuned. Come on, give God some praise today. For those watching me, this message was for you. This message was for everybody who knows. There's some things in my life I've just been living with. I've been living below my means. There's some stuff. And God already came and sent the anointing. I'm good. Man. I want every head bow and every eye closed. Well, want everybody to put their hand over their heart. This is the instructions from the Holy Spirit. Your heart is that vital instrument of life in your physical body. But it's also the place where God's spirit resides. What you're doing right now is you're telling God, Lord, I'm sorry for living like I didn't realize the power you died for me to have. I'm sorry for walking around, crying, being disappointed and worrying when I got you on my side. I'm getting ready to start on this new foundation and I will no longer walk around with unfinished business. Because you are my finisher. Father God, in the name of Jesus, everyone under the sound of my voice, let them realize, don't worry about the surroundings. The disciples didn't worry about it. Don't worry about what people say. They didn't worry about it. There was 120 believers who got anointed and baptized or filled with your spirit that day. Tongues of fire. And now we're in that group. Next time I cry, I'm going to remember I'm filled. So I thank you, God, for what you've done. In Jesus' name, amen. So I give God a good praise today. We have to close. If there's somebody here that does not know the Lord in the part of his sin, I want you to lift your hand. We don't have to go through no one stuff. We're just going to take you back and pray with you to make sure you know God. Is there somebody that does